Hello, welcome to the Real Vision Daily Briefing. It's Tuesday, September 7th, 2021. I'm Maggie Lake. Here with me today is Jared Dillian, author of the DailyDirtNap.com newsletter and Real Vision regular. Jared, great to see you. We're, we're coming hey. fresh off a long holiday weekend. Yeah, um, I'm still a little bit stupid. I'll do my best here. Yeah, <laughs> in, in recovery mode, right? And, and we're glad to see that. But how are you feeling about the markets and sort of September generally? I felt like that first week didn't really count. But we're past the holiday weekend now. How are you feeling about things? Uh, no, I mean, I'm, I'm still bullish equities. Uh, I'm still bullish risk. I, I think, you know, the takeaway from today is pretty simple. Um, you know, the bond market was a bit of a mess. Uh, and 10s are 136, 137. Um, if you look at the chart, we're kind of, it's, it kind of looks like a, uh, head and shoulders bottom and yields, you get tens up to 150, people are gonna get nervous. Um, I think the bond market really drove a lot of the price action in stocks today. Um, you know, I, I, you know, there was a lot of, if you go back three or four weeks ago, there was a lot of discussion about the lower yields. We got down to about 110, 115 on tens. And people said, inflation is over, uh, we're back to deflation. and. Uh, I don't think that was really the case. And a lot of people were saying, well, it's technical reasons that yields are at 110. I don't really know why that happened, but I think that yields are probably going to head higher in a couple weeks. And I think it's going to be a little bumpy for gold and for stocks and for risk. So, you know, I, I, I want to hear why, because, you know, I'm I'm coming off the holiday weekend and I kind of feel like, you know, there's there's so much back and forth. It feels like I'm at the U.S. Open in Arthur Ashe Stadium, and I'm like watching instead of the tennis, I'm watching deflation, inflation, and I see the export data out of China today. And I'm like, okay, you know, recovery, global recovery. Maybe maybe those fears were overstated, and we're back. And then I turn around, and two seconds later, there's another piece of data and a compelling argument why it may be deflation. And so, so why do you think that? you know, we are going to see yields move higher and that we are in this inflationary period. What are yeah. you looking at? So, well, I, I'm not, a, I'm not the quantitative guy. I'm the quanti a qualitative guy. You know, I deal in stories. I deal in anecdotes mm -hmm. and I have a newsletter with a lot of subscribers and I encourage people to give me anecdotes and I get probably half a dozen a day about how there's shortages of this or there's shortages of that. We can't find workers or whatever. I'm hearing it over and over again. You know, there was an article on the New York Post today, you know, it, concurrent with the U.S. Open, there's a shortage of tennis balls. <laughs> there's actually a shortage of tennis balls. Now, the U.S. Open has enough, but nobody else can get any. It's uh, incredible. Penn is sold out. Wilson is sold out. They don't, the manufacturers don't have the raw materials to make the tennis balls. And, you know, that's, that's just like one out of thousands of things. Yeah. I had a conversation with the weekend uh, with a young guy who worked for a food company. And, and he said, the stuff that we're seeing in terms of demand rising and supply going down, like, you know, I, I, I made a statement in my newsletter that I think that we're going to have double digit inflation in six to eight months. I think it's going to happen. We yeah. have PPI on Friday. And uh, it's probably going to be 7% or higher. So it's, you know, I, I really those think. Are, those are big numbers. I think yeah. you I think you even said 10% was possible, no? Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I, the tennis ball uh, anecdote, I, I am also a fan of hearing the stories because you're hearing like what's happening on the street, right on the front line, not sort of in, in an academic office someplace. The shriek of horror that went through my house is that, KFC isn't even advertising its chicken tenders because of supply chain issues, right? They're not even putting the ads on TV and what is like the big season now with Super Bowls because there's just not, there's not, everywhere you look, we are seeing supply chain shortages. But why wouldn't that feed into the, it's temporary. It's it's a, a result of COVID and, and the supply chains and it'll work itself out. And that is not something that's gonna lead to an inflationary spiral. Wouldn't the that feed into that argument? The supply chain issues may be temporary but what's not temporary is the demand side and people's the psychological belief that we now have inflation. When you go into a store and shelves are mm -hmm. empty, you want to buy cat food and the shelves are empty. What is the thought process that goes through your mind? You think, well, next time I go to the store and there's cat food there, I'm going to buy it all. You know, actually, I have six cats, which I tell everybody all the time. 
And uh, I I did this the other day. They had they had cat litter. I bought everything because I don't know when I'm going to get it. You know, and so the act when people believe that there's going to be inflation, they act in such a way that actually causes inflation. My radio show ended back in July. And the second to last radio show, I had Peter Atwater on my show. And it, I, I said, Peter, you know, I think inflation is 90% psychology. He says, I think it's 100% psychology. It's all psychological. And, you know, we had this 40-year period where, where people believed that prices were going lower. And instead of accelerating ac economic activity, they could decelerate economic activity. So, well, I don't have to buy this right now because the price is going to be lower. Like, there's no hurry to buy a TV. It's 500 bucks now. It's going to be 450 next year. And now the whole psychology has changed and everybody is in a hurry. That, that's so interesting. And, and you're right. This explains why, why no country, no central bank has been able to get a handle on inflation. They've been, they've been trying to use all these monetary tools. Um, that doesn't change the psychology behind it. But but do you think that that is, again, like I know we're all in that hoarding mode because of what happened. It's the first time we haven't been able to find things. Uh, and not only are the, were the prices going up, but but we just couldn't find them. So you do go. I mean, I don't even want you don't even want to see what my basement looks like right now. Um, because we're still in that in that mindset. But you don't think that's related at all to this extraordinary period of the pandemic and that once we go through, you know, a, a few months, maybe even a year where things are plentiful, we don't have those empty shelves. You don't think we're going to revert back to the way we used to operate? No, I don't. And I think it's going to get worse before it gets better. You know, based on the things that I'm hearing that I told you about, mm -hmm. I, I think it's I think it's going to get worse before it gets better. Where, where does this put businesses in this case. I mean, if you're, if you're, you know, if they're raising prices, fine, but you know, we have, you know, it's not only goods that we have shortages of too, right? We have labor shortages. How, how do you see that feeding into the inflationary? Are we going to get the traditional wages and then higher prices and wages, or do you see a disconnect? No, what I'm, what I'm hearing from businesses is that they're forced to raise prices because of their input costs going up because of the labor shortages but they are very easily able to pass along these price increases. Now, if you go back a little history, if you go back to the mid 2000s, 2005, six, um, you know, commodity prices were going up and people thought that we were going to get inflation. But the phrase that people were using back then was that businesses did not have pricing power. Mm. Okay. That's what people were saying in 2006. They didn't have pricing power. They couldn't pass along these price increases and they were getting squeezed. Now they do have pricing power and businesses are raising prices, and people are accepting them. For now, but you think they're going to continue to? You think they're going to th think this is the permanent future, and I'm going to have to ask for a raise because I need to somehow afford these price increases. That's right, yeah. What? So what, So how do you position for that? Well, I probably have the portfolio that is the most inflationary portfolio of all time. You know, And I, I started doing this, um, shortly after the pandemic started, probably May, June, July of last year. And over the course of a year, I gradually transitioned every, everything into stuff that benefits from inflation. So I can't go into too much detail and give the portfolio. That's for my subscribers. But it's, you know, anything that you could conceive of that benefits from inflation, it's in the portfolio. You know, it's funny because you can so you you can be right about inflation, but still get killed if your timing isn't right. Right. I want I want to I want to play some sound. I thought we were going to do it a little bit later, but I, based on what you're talking about, I think it's perfect to do it now. Um, coming from Larry McDonald, caught up with Nancy Davis of Quadratic, um, who talked about about some of the tension of that and the risks that bond investors have had to navigate when they're trying to think about inflation. Let's have a listen. Obviously, the longer duration bonds are incredibly sensitive to interest rates. So it's um, and we saw that, right? We saw that in the first quarter of 2021, you know, pretty much most fixed income funds that had any duration risk um, did lose money as yields went higher. You know, if you think about people who own uh, you know, tips, right? How frustrating is that to to lose money when Every single newspaper you look at is now talking about inflation. It's like, finally, you've been a holdout for all these years, like against the grain. Everybody else has been a deflationist. And here your tips lose money. <laughs> so 
<laughs> yeah, it's um, it's been uh, I think you know it's just a tough market because investors have to understand that you know, there are two types of bond risks. There's credit spread risk and there's interest rate risk. And I think a lot of investors have been trying to mitigate their interest rate risk given what happened in the first quarter and given the fear that we will have inflation or higher yields. But they're adding a lot of credit risk to their portfolios. And, and members can hear that full interview, by the way, on Essential Tier. But but what do you make uh, of the idea, Jared, that you know people have been trying, trying to sort of position for the inflation, believing that we're entering a period of inflation, and then getting killed? It hasn't happened, and they've been they've been either on the losing side or just over for, for overpaying for for protection from inflation in their portfolios. Well, you know, the last five or six months have been a little bit rocky for the inflation trade. Um, I have conviction. You know, my my portfolio took, and this is an estimate, it's not audited or anything, mm -hmm. but I took a drawdown of about 6%. So if you can, you know, have a thematic trade on that's supposed to last five or 10 years and take a drawdown of 6%, I mean, you know, it's, it's not really getting killed. It's not fun. Uh, it's, you know, it's it's definitely tough. But in the context of what's something that's going to last five to 10 years, I don't think it's that big of a deal. Mm. You know, I think one of the one of the things that that's been hard for people to separate as they're as they're looking here is sort of the you know, some of the short term effects that we've been seeing. We talked seeing rather we talked a little bit about COVID. We've also had this extreme period of weather here in the U.S. And so when you're looking at these supply chain issues, some of them are far reaching. Some of them may be stickier than others. But we've also had, you know, huge weather upsets that, that are weighing on people's psyche. So, you know, when you're going out to the store, when you're talking about some of those impulses, how can we, again, not be sure that they're just based on these temporary factors we've seen? How do we parse out the longer term trend here? Well, you know, I, I you know, it's risk of repeating myself. I mean, it's really, it's really about this psychological phenomenon of inflation. It's 100% psychology. It transcends weather events. It transcends supply chain issues. It's it's 100% psychological. And th this is going to be a trade that lasts for a long time. Yeah, I, and I'm making you repeat yourself because I hear you on that. I'm just pushing against some of the things that, you know, I, I can understand why people have that feeling. I mean, I have it. I'm, I'm, I'm sitting here in New Jersey. We just had, you know, epic flooding. In fact, the president is here today, uh, you know, um, in what is a disaster zone for people who didn't even know they lived by a river. So we're sort of seeing this. And and certainly I can feel around me that it's influencing people. But, you know, how much of it is baking into the longer term expectation? Clearly, you think it is. I'm a little bit on the fence about that. It's hard for me to, to pull out what's happening short term to some of the longer term things, especially when I think about, you know, one of the reasons that everyone thought deflation was here. And you'll hear this from the people who still believe that we are in a deflationary period is these massive technology waves, automation. And we we just, the, the worker's never been in a position. We talk about companies that are having pricing power. The worker has not been in a position to really demand higher wages. It just hasn't been able to feed through. And as long as you don't have that wage inflation, you know, central banks certainly have been willing to look to the side. Do you well, I think also if you want to talk about if you want to talk about the technology aspect of it, it's it's interesting that you bring that up. I mean, we've sort of been taking it as a given that the prices of electronics were gonna were declining over a long period of time. You know, Taiwan Semiconductor just raised prices 20%. It's the first price hike in semiconductors of all time. And within a couple of years, we're gonna run up against the technological limits of Moore's law, how many how many semiconductors we can fit. Like it's, you know, I think that. You know, people have taken for granted this idea that technology is this big deflationary force, but we're actually getting to the end of that force. And that's not going to be the case going forward. Yeah, that, that's an excellent point. And, and we may have reached a point where we're getting to the end of the really cheap supply of labor that has provided this kind of globalization of wages. Um, that's taken the pressure off. If you have to pay more here, we're just going to relocate it someplace else. That has been China. There is an open question, I think, as to whether that can continue. So that would certainly feed into your reflation. So uh, I have a scenario. quick story. I have a quick story. This is great. 
So I moved to South Carolina in 2010 and I went to Walmart. It, uh, we just moved into a new house and we had to buy a doormat. And I'm in Walmart and I look and there's a pile of doormats. You know, it's got the AstroTurf on it. And the doormats were $4. And I, I pulled it up and it said made in China. And I said, can you imagine manufacturing this doormat, shipping it all the way across the world and selling it for $4 and still having a profit margin? I looked up the doormat on walmart.com the other day. It's $34. There you go. There you go. That is that is exactly what you're talking about in terms of expectations. Yeah, I don't know that I don't know that people have made e, e, you think psychology is changing. I'm not even sure people have put that together yet. I think they just think it's it's because of COVID. <laughs> Like, right, no, like, oh, that, wait, like, there's no ship, it's stuck in the port, it's temporary. If that sticks in any way, that's a huge jump. Even if it comes down, you're still talking about it at a very ele elevated level. Yeah, yeah. I'm not going to have a doormat in front of my house if they're $34, yeah. I'll tell you that. Um, does gold fit into the scenario for you? Is that a, is that a hedge against inflation? Uh, gold is, it is a hedge. It's an imperfect hedge. Uh, it, uh, it, it works over very long periods of time, it's it's more correlated with budget deficits than anything else. I mean, gold is a bunch of different things. Um, you know, gold is about 30% of my portfolio, not specifically gold, but gold and miners and silver and silver miners and stuff like that. But all precious metals are about 30% of my portfolio. And I have a great deal of patience with this. I bet, you know, I've had a, a lot of patience with it since 2005. And, you know, since 2005, I, I want to say that the performance of precious metals versus stocks has been probably about equal. So, you know, I haven't really lost anything in terms of performance. Mm. Uh, we're, we're getting comments uh, from the audience. There's there's um, some wonder and curiosity about the idea that sort of that tech deflation or tech spur deflation is going to end. One person, uh, Josh, suggesting, isn't it short-sighted to think that new tech can't be introduced. Well, I mean, if you if you take the position that you know this deflationary force of technology is coming to an end, it's inherently a very pessimistic position. Mm -hmm. And I see where he's coming from. I mean, that's you know what you're saying is that we won't develop new technologies that'll be even more deflationary. And you know that's. Uh, I am pessimistic about it. Um, you know, I'm pessimistic about technological progress. I think we've sort of, and this is more of a philosophical question, but I think we're running up against the limits of it in the early part of the 2020s. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I suppose, do you think you're, we're running up against the limits of it in a way that would influence the price of goods? Or do you think we're just running up against a limit of it? Because, it, you know, technology influences so many things. We're talking about computers and chips before, you know, in terms of if you think about robotics and automation and the type of jobs that you'd be able to ha to, to replace, that, that, that just seems like it's getting going. So it depends, I guess it depends on what part of, you know, technology and the inflation relationship you're looking at. Yeah. Let me, let me put it this way. I think 10 years from now, we'll look at the universal basic income idea as a bad idea, the whole premise behind it. Why is that? Well, because, you know, the, the idea behind universal basic income is that we would have so much automation and they would basically force unemployment and we would have to compensate these people in some respect because we're basically eliminating jobs because of automation. I think that process is going to happen a lot more slowly than people think. What leads you to believe that? <laughs> <laughs> to, just to follow this line of thinking. I, I, uh, jo, nobody, I love that. There's, there's, you, you've hit a, you've hit a vein here that's resonating with people and, and some people disagreeing. Obviously, I think there are probably a lot of people who are, who are in tech that, that don't believe this, but, um, uh, I, I'm not even going to read them all because there are too many to to go over right now. But um, just just to go back a second, there are, um, you know, I think that the that we have for a long time been in this um, you know argument with deflation, and and I think it's hard if you're if you're switching, it's hard to know when you've entered a new period. There are some who you know, do you look at things like bank lending when you're thinking about this? 
Um, I mean, I feel like people think maybe that they're not outlending, and this is this this is kind of feeding into that deflationary argument. Do you look at that at all? No, I don't look at it. I, I, what I do is, you know, I'm being the qualitative guy. I talk mm -hmm. to people and I and I listen to stories and I listen to what people tell me. And people's attitudes towards price increases have totally changed in the last year. It, you know, yeah. I'm the I'm the I'm the market psychology guy. I mean, this is this is what I focus on. Yeah. So. Yeah. No. And listen, it's it's it, it it's it's key. I mean, we we know that none of the other inflation models have been working. So I think when you're when you're talking about how people feel and approach this, um, you know, we need to be looking at that. Uh, I we had some. Uh, obviously huge news today with Bitcoin. Um, we saw a sharp drop. El, El Salvador, you know, um, it was the first official day with its experiment. Um, what's your what's your feeling about the fall we had? I don't think you were a big fan before. Has that changed? Are you thinking about cryptocurrencies as an inflation hedge, given the fact that you feel like we are going to see this surge in inflation? Um, I don't currently have a position in any cryptocurrencies. You know, I do watch, and I th this today was a classic, like old school trading day. You know, El Salvador, you know, finally adopts Bitcoin. It's a sell the news event. Uh, if you look at some of the technical work that Tommy Thornton has been doing with the mark indicators, you had exhaustion on the top side, and it was, you know, it was, uh, it, w it was almost inevitable that this was going to happen. I don't really have a long term view. I mean, but in terms of, you know, sentiment significance from a trading standpoint, it's very similar to when Elon Musk went on, you know, SNL with Dogecoin. It's it's a, it's a classic sell the news event. Hmm. You know, I. Cryptos aside, what about any time we're looking at people wanting to diversify and, and, you know, this would always be the time years and years ago, you'd be, you know, hearing about art as investment or, you know, uh, collectible cars, you know, something physical, something tangible. Uh, this time around, it's a little bit different. And I know you've been watching the NFT space. Is, is you're not, you don't have a position in cryptos. Are you thinking about anything in that area, especially when it comes to what's happening with art and music and the creative? There's been a lot of interesting, and I know I heard you talking to Ash and Jack uh, a couple of weeks ago about some of the things that are happening there. Um, that seems like an area where there is an awful lot of attention, an awful lot of VC money flowing that way. Yeah, I mean, I think I think NFTs are a great innovation. I actually think NFTs are more of an innovation than the crypto itself. Um, you know, it establishes property rights in the digital realm, where in you know in the past things could be infinitely copied. Um, there is no first use doctrine. So I, you know, I, I love NFTs, but what we have right now is, you know, for sure, it's a speculative bubble. It's the stuff, you know, the stuff that's worth a half a million bucks is all crap. It's pictures of rocks. It's pictures of robots, stuff like that. I mean, but one day, 10 to 20 years from now, this is how people are going to be transacting in art and music is with NFTs. You know, some of my favorite digital artists, you know, a guy like David McLeod, who's fantastic. You know, you can go, I mean, this this is fine art. This is fantastic stuff. You can buy his NFTs for like 600 bucks. It's, you know, it's very cheap. And yet you have something that somebody drew crudely over the course of 45 minutes and it's a rock and it's trading for a million bucks. Like it doesn't make any sense. So that's going to work itself out over time. Yeah. Um, I, I know you are a music person, and I think that there's some really interesting things happening with independent artists or artists using this as a way to connect with fans. There seems to be a, a huge amount of momentum. We talk all the time about sort of, you know, uh, mainstream moving into some of these areas and institutions getting involved. It seems like there's an enormous amount of stuff happening with the music industry, even more than anything else when it comes to this space. Yeah, there's actually a, a DJ producer named Davi um, who... He, he, uh, I follow him on Facebook, and he had this big, long Facebook rant about how he produces these tracks, and he sells them on Beatport, and he basically gets like 10 or 20% of the purchase price. He'll make like $5 off of a track. Like it does, He says the model is broken. Like Producers are not getting paid for this stuff. Yeah. So he says, I'm going to do something cool. I'll be back. So then what he did was he went with Brian Armstrong, the CEO of Coinbase, and they sat down together at a computer and they produced a piece of music. So Brian Armstrong is actually a, a co-producer on a track 
and they sold it as an NFT for twenty seven thousand dollars. That's that's I'm not going to say that's the same, but that's amazing. It is amazing. It is amazing. Considering yeah. the the other scenario you just laid out. Yeah. Is this? Yeah, I I think that um you know that that for for people who've been in that, I wonder if that you know I wonder if that's going to accelerate if this is happening in pockets or that's going to accelerate. Um, if if that is true, it would it would suggest that there'd be enormous growth. And I'm just wondering what that means if people are looking at it as an asset class. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's, NFTs are not really an asset class. Collectibles are an asset class. Mm. And NFTs fall under collectibles. So it's comic books, it's art, it's uh, baseball cards, and it's NFTs. Those are all collectibles. And collectibles as an asset class are super, super hot right now. It's yeah. not just the NFTs. I mean, you have comic books that are trading for millions of dollars. So really, it's it's all collectibles. And by the way, that kind of gets us back to the inflation conversation because, right. you know, during periods of high inflation, collectibles get very, very high valuations. Yeah, absolutely. As people look to, to, to you know, to diversify, put their money someplace. Is there anything that you're 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 moving out of? Is there anything that you are? I mean, you mentioned that you think equities could go higher. Um, is that, is that, I mean, is that based on, you know, what ha what's happening with the Fed and interest rates? If, if we're in an inflationary period, do you expect that we're going to have to see the Fed play catch up and raise rates sooner than expected? Uh, I don't believe the Fed is going to act anytime soon. I mean, we basically have negative 6% real interest rates right. right now. And if, if you ever find yourself in a period of time where you have negative 6% real interest rates, you should buy stocks. <laughs> for for sure, you should buy stocks. <laughs> so I don't I don't care what else is going on. Um, yeah. So. So and so you I mean do you see do you see equities continuing to grind higher as long as the the Fed policy remains the same? I mean, is there anything to derail that? Um, I have a tough time believing that the Fed is going to taper or hike rates with unemployment above. 5% or even 4.5%. I think if unemploy the unemployment rate got down to 4.5%, then it's possible that they could taper. But that is several months into the future, maybe more than a year. Yeah. Jared, what do you think is going on with the labor market? I mean, this has been everywhere. You know, Speaking of you know, uh, anecdotally what we see out and about, I don't think there's anybody listening to this who hasn't been someplace and felt the labor shortage, seen the help wanted signs, I mean, you know, places are cutting shifts. They're having to close on days because they just can't find anyone. What's your sense of what's going on? Uh, I don't think I have any more insight than you. I've heard some interesting stories. I'm hearing stories of people making $100,000 a year to throw boxes around in a warehouse. I'm hearing stories of people painting houses for $85,000 a year. Um, it's And still... You know, what? If, if you go back like a year ago and you asked me, you know, if people were going to be getting paid so much money, they would come off the bench and go back to work, but they're not. So there's mm -hmm. something profoundly psychological at play here. And I, I, ha I really have a tough time putting my finger on it, but I think that people are, uh, what's the best way to put it? They're, it's kind of a YOLO thing. Like they're just living it up and they just don't want, you know, and I think people, their, their experience with working before was negative and they don't want to go back to jobs. So really like, you know, and the funny thing is the fed looks at this and the fed says, okay, the labor market is broken and we should not taper because, you know, we have all these people outside the labor force easing monetary policy. Isn't going to get people to get jobs. It's not, there's no connection there. Well, yeah, I, well, I certainly don't see how you can use that as a tool when we don't understand why it's happening. I mean, I used to, uh, a, a while back, I spent some time and, and um, went and talked to some people at Carnegie Mellon and, and MIT who were doing all sorts of amazing things with robotics. And their argument at the time was that the, that you know the jobs that were dirty, dangerous, and dull were going to be replaced by technology, i.e. some sort of robotic thing. Well, and, and that may have been true, but but that does not explain what's happening right now. I mean, you know, technology is not replacing all these jobs. 
I, I do think that people don't want them because of those reasons. But where are they going and how are they getting money? I, I'm not so sure about that. I mean, is, are they moving into the gig economy? Is that not being captured someplace? I, I don't think I've, I've seen a compelling reason uh, or a compelling explanation of what's going on. Well, I think we'll find out in the next couple of weeks. I mean, we just had a bunch of unemployment benefits expire. So that'll sort of test that thesis. You know, we asked this question, where is the money coming from? What are these people living off of? You know, if the unemployment benefits disappear, then you should see people re-enter the labor force in the next month or two. Yeah, it hasn't happened for the ones that have rolled off uh, so far, but perhaps there was a thought they'd be extended again or something. And so we'll get, I think, uh, with a little bit more time and more states rolling off, we will get a good idea. But that's going to certainly feed into your inflation thesis. Um, Jared, it was such a pleasure to talk to you. Thanks for letting me push you on some of those thoughts a little bit, because I think this is, you know, the big debate that people are trying to figure out. And it's really important, especially for, for people who do believe inflation is coming. It's going to mean some big changes if that's the new psychological mindset. It's something we all need to think deeply on. So, so appreciate that. Well, if anybody needs any conviction on inflation, they can just borrow mine. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Thanks so much, Jared. Great to see you as always. Tomorrow, Jack Farley will be hosting Darius Dale of 42 Macro. In the meantime, join us on The Exchange. That's Real Vision Social Network, where the conversation will continue. We'll see you again soon. Thanks. Uh -huh.